welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining. And um, my biggest challenge with this talk is going to be fitting it into the time allotted. I am well known as a speaker for going over time when I have 60 minute time slots and 75 minute time slots. So this one's gonna be tricky for me. I'm gonna do my best. Uh, but because of that, please do feel free to ask questions as we go along. The producers are gonna capture those and send them to me. In all likelihood, we won't have time for questions at the end. I'm just setting your expectations super low so that maybe I can beat them. Um, but I will be around after the session and I'll go over into Wheelow if you would like to chat and we'll give you some contact information how to reach me if you want to have a follow up conversation about anything that I've shared in the talk. So today, here we go. Underpants, Gnomes, and Kanban. Um, quick introduction, I am Cheryl Hammond. I speak a fair amount on the Agile circuit. I'm absolutely thrilled to have been invited to submit for this conference. And I'm really excited about being able to speak to an audience. I don't frequently get over to conferences in Europe because I self pay for most of my speaking. And so it's great to be able to have a global audience and to talk to a new mix of people. So I'm really grateful to be able to be part of this. I work for a company called Contino. We have offices in the States as well as Australia and the UK. We are hiring like crazy. I will be putting up my recruiting slide at the end. So if anything that I've talked about or, or, or acted like sounds interesting to you and you'd like to, to know more about working with us, please let me know. Uh, we focus on digital transformation primarily via DevOps. So my talk today is not particularly technical, but the rest of my company is, is quite. Um, but we have the, the whole range. And uh, just a couple of quick housekeeping things. I will throw this slide up again at the end because it has a couple of good links on it. Most, um, all of my slides from all of my talks are stored on SlideShare at BasketCase. And uh, I am at BasketCase on Twitter if you want to include me in your Twitter posts. I have also used the hashtag Kanban Gnomes. Um, and I'll go take a look on Twitter for that if you have any reactions to the talk or questions about it. So that's an other good way to reach me and carry on the conversation. Again, I'll have this one up at the end. And then here's some, some non-interesting things about me. Um, I've been in the industry for a long time now. I put the plus sign there so that I don't have to keep updating the years on that slide anymore. And I do this, you know, by whatever name, Agile, Lean, Kanban stuff. Uh, I didn't put on here. I happen to be a certified trainer for scrum.org um, in the scrum uh, professional scrum with Kanban practice, as well as a certified trainer for pro Kanban. And uh, I don't actually do a whole lot with that, but I love being part of these communities. It's really valuable to me to learn from all the other folks that are in the respective trainer communities. Um, having said that, you're going to find in a moment that I'm very pragmatic and not at all dogmatic about the ways that these practices are implemented. I've been a consultant for a long time, and so I understand that um, there's been so many instances of me going into a client and saying, here's my conventional wisdom, and then having it absolutely not work and have to re-examine all my priors. Um, and I imagine that many of you have had similar experiences. So uh, at this point in my career, I'm much more about being curious about why things don't work than being um, too pushy about what I think should work because I have a lot more to learn from you most of the time than any of you have to learn from me, to be perfectly honest. So, okay, let's get to it. We're going to talk about why on earth are there underpants in this conversation and how does that relate to Kanban? We'll talk about a couple of practical tips. Again, they'll be pretty compressed for time. I'm going to try to hit all three of them, fingers crossed. Um, and then if we have any time at the end, don't hold your breath, but we'll, uh, we'll leave that for any conversation and questions that you may have, and then carry it on after the session. So here's the problem. Okay, first of all, how many of you were familiar with what the underprints gnomes refers to that isn't Kanban? How many of you recognize the reference? <laughs> See, it's gotten old enough now that like most people do not remember. This was an episode of South Park in the first season. And it isn't called the underpants gnomes, it's called something else. But there's a storyline in a particular episode about a kid, not one of the core kids, who um, it, it, they believe he's delusional, but it turns out that the underpants gnomes actually exist. And it's a group of gnomes that come out of his closet at night while he's sleeping and they steal his underpants. And so the kids confront the gnomes 
and they ask the gnomes, why are you stealing underpants? And the answer is that it's part of the gnome's business plan, which is this. Phase one, collect underpants. Phase two, I don't know. Phase three, profit. And the whole thing was a send up of, at the time, the dot-com economy, which I am old enough to have been a part of, with lots of startups having business plans that essentially boil down to collect underpants, we don't know, profit. And when I first started consulting, learning about Kanban and trying to implement Kanban with teams, what I learned, um, I felt very quickly, was that it felt a lot like implementing Kanban consisted of make work visible, we're not quite sure what happens next, and then there will be flow. And when I went to work with clients, when we went to put Kanban into place, frequently we would find that the part about building a Kanban board was fairly intuitive and even kind of fun. And so I went to, to company after company, team after team, where there would be big elaborate visual displays with color coding and yarn and magnets and you know cartoons and fun stuff. But once the big visible display was up, what I was seeing was a lack of momentum to continue making any changes or that there would be changes made that wouldn't work and the teams couldn't really figure out why. And so at some point after that initial excitement of we're gonna go do Kanban, of course, you know, I'm old enough now that that was a very new, very exciting thing. We're gonna do Kanban. It would, as many of these transformation efforts by any other names also do, it would have a, a peak and then it would kind of fall off and plateau and feel very stalled. And I did a good amount of work with teams who just weren't sure what to do next. And I made the joke a million years ago that it felt like the underpants gnomes all over again. And that makes for a really entertaining conference talk. So here we are. So what I wanna talk about in this talk is some ideas, these are small things that can help restart a Kanban implementation after that initial honeymoon has worn off, after the thrill of collecting the underpants and you're not quite sure what to do with the big pile of underpants now. Uh, how do we keep things moving in order to actually deliver some of the business outcomes and human outcomes that we are hoping to achieve with Kanban? So let's talk first about kind of um, the notion of Kanban itself I, I, I love this slide, the concept of Kanban, the name comes to us from the Japanese meaning visual card or visual board. And therefore, kind of right in the name, we've got the visual display is front and center. But there is a bit of an assumption that if we put all our problems out here where people can see them, and we've got that idea of start where you are, visualize the process that you have, and that may be replicated in any number of things, right? It could be in your, God help you, JIRA implementation, or it could be a, a physical display, or it could be a value stream mapping session, or any number of things where you're attempting to capture current state. But the idea behind Kanban, of course, that, you know, that Toyota reference is that Kanban refers to not just the visual card or the visual board, but the process behind it. The, the actions that you take to enable work to flow more efficiently through your system, then it, it doesn't pop as much for people, but that's, that's where we're trying to get the benefits. Okay, so we stall at phase two. Why do we stall at phase two? Of course, not everybody stalls at phase two. Maybe you stall at phase three or phase four, right? And I think part of the problem is I've seen that the idea behind visualizing work is to expose the pains and the inefficiencies in the system. And you immediately run into a problem where not everybody likes it. We don't like feeling pain. I saw a lot of teams trying to sort of paper over things on their board and maybe make them not look quite so bad because it's one thing to talk about our pains amongst ourselves. It's another thing to have the vice president of the company know what they are and maybe make assumptions about why they are and how they how they, how they got there. But then in addition to that, so to some degree, I think we see, we feel resistance. The idea of visualizing our process, how it is, can be challenging. 
Um, but then also seeing a problem on the board and knowing anything about how to fix it are very, very different things. And oftentimes I think when teams are in the middle of those problems and have been for years, they may, they may have, the board may not be telling them anything they didn't already know or assume, right? They're getting, they're seeing a lot of things on the board that feel like problems. That doesn't necessarily mean that they know how to solve those problems. Now, the idea behind moving towards Kanban is, again, it's not supposed to be just the board and then stop. It's supposed to be the board and a bunch of other good practices. But how do we move from seeing things on the board and having any idea of which practices to implement, when, why, how long, what outcomes are we expecting? So, so how can we use what we know from Kanban to help us with some of this basic problem solving to keep moving forward? Um, so let's start with the real obvious one, right? There are a lot of different writings about what is Kanban. And because there's not a single definitive thing that somebody owns the way the Scrum Guide is, the Kanban has a lot of different definitions written by different people. Um, I've had slides in here, they take up too much time, but that talk about there being three pillars and five pillars and six pillars and four pillars and two pillars. And, and it depends on who you ask as to what the, you know, what is the, the process for implementing Kanban and what are the elements? It's not quite so set in stone. I think that's an advantage because it gives you flexibility, but it means that folks who are new to the community and new to trying to think in a Kanban sort of way oftentimes have so many different directions to go that it's not clear where they should focus. And to start with the most obvious one, I think many of the different interpretations of Kanban do go directly from make work visible straight to limiting work in process. So limiting work in process is a pretty obvious next step. And a lot of teams try it. Have any of you tried to do that? And how did it go? Give us, you know, give us your old thumbs up, thumbs down on the camera or what have you, right? Did it, because I think it, uh, yeah, right? Like this, like, okay, it kind of works. And I, I feel that. And I've seen places where limiting whip crashes and burns. And I've seen places where people take to it and it makes sense. And so it's not a slam dunk for phase two for everybody. And for those folks that limiting whip works, I would tend to think, okay, then you're off to the races, right? If you can get your head around limiting work in process, the benefits of doing that are usually great and usually should get you going on a path towards flow, although they don't always. In the next one, I'm gonna talk about why that is. Okay, so why, but in those cases where limiting work and process doesn't work, and I don't mean that you limited it exactly correctly and that didn't work, although that can sometimes happen, but in those cases, what, what could be going on? Well, let's talk about what limiting work and process might look like. Right? The canonical thing is that you've got your board and then you have at the top of the board a limit to the number of items that can be in that column at any given time. And you use that across, you know, could be individual columns, could be system wide. And what you're trying to do is get the team to focus on a smaller number of things and move them through the system faster. And for those of us that are get excited about the math, something like Little's Law mathematically proves the idea that if we can limit work in process in the system, we can reduce cycle time, which is one of the things that can make a positive flow in your process really visible and demonstrate the benefits, right? We can get cycle time, stuff gets done more quickly. And usually the people that we work for who want us to do the stuff like getting their stuff more quickly. So that seems like a win all around if we can make it work. But why might it not work? Well, <clears throat> as a good second step, it's very familiar. There's tons of literature out there. You will find lots of people writing and speaking on limiting WIP. There's a lot of support for it. And I think limiting WIP lends itself to an incremental approach because you can limit it. You can identify what your working process is now and reduce it a tiny bit from where it is now without causing the whole system to fall apart. And you can maybe make a few improvements and then it reduce it a tiny bit more. You don't have to reduce it 
all the way down to single piece flow in the first week of your new process, right? However, what are some reasons why it might not work? Well, I was amazed at the number of times that I went into teams and they just flat said no. Like they don't like the wording, they roll their eyes when they hear about work in process, WIP doesn't mean anything to them, they wouldn't engage with the idea, even in organizations that had brought me in to help them implement Kanban. Folks were really shutting it out. The idea of limiting WIP, eh, don't wanna do it. Or, and this one to me is super common, there are big red numbers at the top of the columns on the board and nobody pays the slightest bit of attention to them. Or you've got JIRA set up and you've got the thing where it says, or Trello, you've got the thing where it says that you've, you've got a limit on this number in the column and it's red all the time because you're ignoring it. You're just violating it, right? Or there's cheating, moving stuff back. Oh, well, this one got blocked. We'll move it out so that it doesn't go against our whip and, right? There's lots of those little things that we do to undermine the whole point. The whole point of a blocked item takes up room in your work in process. That's supposed to get your attention. It's supposed to be painful. And it's supposed to make you want to go clear the block so that you can move the thing. But more often than not, honestly, I was seeing teams who would want to do something like blocked items don't count. Though we can't have those count. It's not our fault it's blocked. It's, uh, yes. I'd still like you to go find the person whose fault it is and chase them around your office building until they resolve the block. If that, if that really is the most important work to do, why would you not do that, right? But the reality is your most important work to do might not have been their most important work to do. And now you've found a system problem that you as a team by yourself cannot resolve, right? Teams get very stuck with that. So a lot of that like conventional wisdom around limiting, and, and I haven't even gotten into Pre pressure from management to start more things. But there's lots of things that cause people to take steps that undermine the effectiveness of limiting WIP. There's more to it than that though. I think there's another piece to limiting WIP that I discovered by accident and I, I don't have time to do the full case study in this talk. It takes me about 20 minutes to talk through this whole journey of learning. But I have other talks and other recordings where I talk about, there was a case, an instance where I was using the old Get Kanban board game. Um, I use Get Kanban version two because it's the free one. And we made a version of the free one and we printed out lots of boards. And I used to run it as a workshop with six or seven teams at a time as a way of learning about the principles in play. Now, you can do something like that with uh, Twig is the new online, is the online version um, that I think some of the speakers at this conference will talk about. It's pretty cool. Uh, I still like the, you know, the pretty colors and the rolling of dice and the physicality of the board game, but I'm old school. That board game, we went in and, train, and, and taught on that board game with the thought that it was going to open people's eyes to the value of limiting whip. Because there's, there's a whole mechanic in that game where you're supposed to be, you know, there's a temptation to increase whip in particular places and you're supposed to be trying to show them that if you lower whip, it will yield a good result. And class after class, I could not get teams to do it. And my co-presenter and I finally got irritated and we sat down and we said, fine, we're gonna show you all, we're gonna fast play a game with super low whip and you're gonna show you how well it works. And it didn't work. Our cycle times were horrible and we didn't make any money in the game and we didn't get any better at moving stories through and we're like whoa wait a minute we are the experts in this what have we screwed up so that's my condensed case study there's a longer version of that but here's what we found that was really interesting specific to the get kanban version 2 game the startup instructions in the game i'm going to show you a picture from that actually i'm just going to jump ahead and show you that picture because it's so good uh, this is the starting state of the board in version two. And the reason I think this is significant is because this is very much like trying to put Kanban in place in a team with backlogs already in flight, right? Most of your teams are going to have work that is already being done and a process that is already in place. And this is the thing that was significant to me about 
the fact that the, the, the starting state of this board, this is how they have you in the instructions, set up the board before you begin to play. There are 17 items on this board. Their total work in process is 17 for a team of eight. That's actually quite high in terms of, in my view of what, just my quick and dirty of whip is that that's quite high. But something that you will notice here is that there's quite a bit of stuff in these columns. There's some assumption that it's one item. Well, yeah, actually, because that's how many pe people there are in those roles, right? I think that actually the number of people might be less. Um, it's a very small team with a very high amount of whip and quite a few cues. So we are looking at a system where cues have already formed as a result of various bottlenecks in the system. In the case of the game, it's bottlenecks in testing, which you find out very quickly after you start playing. So let's talk about attacking cues because what changed the literal game, right? We were using Get Kanban as a teaching tool. What changed the way we taught that game was when we realized that simply limiting WIP in a system that already had a lot of cues formed did not cause the cues themselves to clear out in a timely manner. So the cues would clear eventually, but in the game, by the time the game was over, you had just started to get a little bit of momentum on a little bit faster flow. But cycle times when we initially limited whip were horrendous for a long time because those items that were queued needed to finish moving through the system. So as a starting point, limiting whip in the context of that game didn't make any sense. It didn't show results and it didn't give people a feeling that anything was improving. And that tended to make them abandon limiting whip. They tended to want to go the other way and increase it, which then made everything worse. When we changed our teaching method to let's look for cues and attack them as our first, well, second, right? We visualize as our second step. That became really intuitive because again, right? You can see cues. I can quiz people on this. I have other sample boards that I sometimes put up and I say, where are the cues? Where, and by cue, what I mean is, where are some states that work is sitting and value is not currently being added to that work? And any place that those exist is an opportunity to go after the cues. Now, that's a backdoor way of limiting whip because as we start to take steps to prevent the cues from existing in that place, oftentimes what we're saying is, let's just make it so that we don't use a done column. Because a done column just means it's sitting and waiting for the next state. That's not actually being pulled. It's a waiting state for it to be pulled to the next working state, right? The place where work is being done is actually being, is, is illuminated on this screen just great, better than it might be on your, you know, your team's board or your client's board. They've actually given us in the game this for free. It's the place where doing is happening. Now, in some cases, like, here in the development doing column or the test doing column, the reality was that these three in test were most likely not being touched. Only the top one was being touched at any given time. So something that you can do when you're looking at your own board to figure out where your cues are is first you go after states. Which states are action states, working states? Which ones are waiting states? Waiting states are automatically suspect. Why do you have waiting states? How long are things in waiting states? What can you do to shorten the time of a waiting state? What can you do to prevent work from being done upstream before it's ready? The idea behind Kanban is we want to create a pull system where we only do this work when someone downstream is ready to receive the results of that work. So we want to try to prevent the formation of those waiting states. If you haven't been doing a flow-based process before and you're just adopting it, you will have these all over the place because of course you will. You weren't preventing them. So it's a great first place to go. It's easy to see. It's easy to talk about how the amount of time a story spends in a waiting state costs you against your cycle time. It causes you to look slow. It causes you to look bad as a team. I have talked about how cues are evil and make you look bad. Cues make your manager angry. Right? It's very visceral, minutes, really easy, really easy to get on board with that, right? 
Now, the challenge with queues is you can go after a queue with a bug bash or some kind of a dedicated effort, but it doesn't always prevent the queue from reforming. And this is where you want that positive loop of attacking queues followed up by some kind of a whip limit to prevent the queue from reforming, some kind of a process change that amounts to a whip limit. Right, to prevent queues from reforming. That's hard. Preventing queues can be really, really difficult. And for an organization that culturally is heavily invested in utilization of their people, didn't talk about this under limit whip, but when people think that being busy is the thing that adds value rather than delivering value being the thing that adds value, a lot of this stuff will get a lot of resistance. I'm going to hit my last point because I told you I was going to try to get three. And I have like one minute. So let's do that. Um, this is another one that is very simple, can do in isolation by itself, and can be very effective with teams. Some teams really respond super well to it. And it is the idea of looking oftentimes when we are a team having a stand up or a morning check in around a big visible display and planning our work for the day. And this could be a scrum team, Kanban team, any kind of process. We have a tendency to start from the beginning and say, what's new, what's coming in? What do we need to start working on? When what we actually wanna to try to do, if you see that, is get people in the habit of looking at what is the closest thing to being finished? Because the most valuable thing I could do today is take something that is this close to being finished and get it over the finish line and get it into done. And it's amazing to be the number of teams who have these beautiful boards who you can see from the way they interact with the boards do not value done. What they value is more stuff on the board. And you can smell that. So when I see that, I want to redirect people to the beauty of having things done. Now, why might that not work? Well, oftentimes done for me is not actually done for the business. There's some other thing that happens after me before a thing gets into production. And if the bottleneck in my company is there, then it almost doesn't matter how fast I flow work through my system because it's just gonna end up in somebody else's queue. That to me is the most likely. If people do not feel like your vision of done resonates with them, it may be because it's not done for them. It's only done for you. No one cares about that. Right. So then you've got to figure out, well, how do you get your done to be closer to real done? Right. That's, that's a goal. Um, but it is a super good focus for regardless, for the team to, you may have to create some artificiality around the value being done. Uh, my colleagues and I talked about a beer column or the party column. Right? You've got a whip limit on your done column, it's 20 or 30. And then you have a party column. When you hit your whip limit, everything moves into the party column and you have a party. Right? Something to make people feel like done is a good goal. So if it's not, then this whole system becomes kind of a challenge to implement. So that's it. As I promised, I am totally at time. But some quick hits, ways for you to try to to rejuvenate a Kanban implementation. If it didn't stall at the place I said, but it stalled somewhere else, again, I hope you've got a couple of ideas for new ways to try, new approaches to try, new explanations to try to get people motivated around some of these changes that can be confusing and difficult. So uh, looking to the right, oh, sorry, wrong direction of arrow. There we go. And finally, uh, as I mentioned, Contino is hiring. If you are interested in the DevOps, space or the transformation space. Uh, we are hiring many roles at many different levels. We would love to have you join us. Uh, that's our link. Tell them I sent you or message me if you have questions about what that would entail. And I want to thank them for giving me time to be here with you and, and for giving me these lovely slide templates. Um, and then finally, here's some of my information. Again, you can find these slides. I'll get these uploaded, but there's other versions of this talk that are uploaded on SlideShare already, as well as many other of my talks. Um, and you can reach me on Twitter at Basket Case, as well as I believe the producers have put my LinkedIn information in the chat. You are welcome to contact me there. Happy to continue the conversation. So thank you so much for joining and have a wonderful rest of your conference.